So bridge and attack simulation is the capability to safely, uh, first and foremost, uh, continuously and automatically challenge your IT infrastructure with various attacks across the attacker kill chain. And that's basically being proactive, not waiting for the attackers to tell you where the gaps are or where you should focus. Welcome to Cybersecurity Heroes, an Iron Skills podcast about you, the heroes of cybersecurity. You're about to hear and learn practical and experiential knowledge in our conversations with CISOs, security directors and architects, SOC analysts, and other InfoSec stars so we can become more cyber resilient and safer together. Let's get into the show. Welcome to Cybersecurity Heroes. I'm your host for today's episode, Brendan Rudd, Community Director at Ironscales, an email security platform powered by AI, enhanced by thousands of customer security teams, and built around detecting and removing threats in the inbox. We offer a service that is fast to deploy, easy to operate, and is unparalleled in the ability to stop all types of email threats, including advanced attacks like business email compromise, account takeover, and more. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get into the show. Hey, Yotam. Welcome to the show. Hey, great to be here and thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for taking the time to join us. I know it's uh, a little late, your time in Tel Aviv. A normal day at the office working with the US. So. <laughs> yeah, 7 o'clock is lunchtime, right? <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> so <laughs> before we jump in, I'd love to hear a little bit about you, your background and what you're working on these days. Yeah, so uh, I'm today VP of product at SafeBridge and i um, my early background is in security research. I led the security research teams at Checkpoint and then uh, Radler. And then for many years after that, I was leading various aspects of security portfolio and product management in, uh, across uh, various uh, security business units. And what is keeping you up these days? What are you working on? Well, um, I, I think taking uh, what we do and uh, expanding it through different aspects of the security organization and the security uh, program and the different environments that basically come from digitization of organization, from the move to the cloud, are things that we are focused on these days. And again, before we jump in, would you say since COVID, there has been an uptick in a demand for your type of product, which we're going to get into in a second, but um, just curious, things have changed for you guys since the pandemic. Definitely, I think the pandemic accelerated a lot of processes around the organizations focusing on accelerating their digital strategy, accelerating their cloud transition. And uh, that definitely accelerated their uh, demand for uh, security in general. And um, uh, for us, being a product, which uh, we'll talk about a little bit later, but being a, a technology which helps organizations understand a lot about their environment, um, I, I think it had a, a significant impact. Uh, because when you're making a lot of changes uh, in the environment, being informed is something really important for the security team. Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, without any further ado, let's get into the theme of today's topic, which is uh, breach and attack simulation, also known as BAS. So would you mind just breaking down for us what is breach and attack simulation for those who may not be familiar? So breach and attack simulation is the capability to safely uh, first and foremost, uh, continuously and automatically challenge your IT infrastructure with various attacks across the attacker kill chain. And that's basically being proactive, not waiting for the attackers to tell you where the gaps are or where you should focus, rather doing that yourself in a, in a safe way, basically enabling the security program, the security operation, and the security tools to be utilized uh, to the best extent. And what would you say are like the main problems that breach and attack simulation solves? What are the main benefits of using such a product? So as you probably know, or as some of you probably know, um, uh, the security uh, um, uh, industry um, has 
offered to the market a lot of technology in the past 10 to 15 years. Organizations and many organizations have invested in various types uh, of technologies um, and, and, and have a lot of tools. So the average enterprise will have more than 70 different security vendors in their uh, environment. But an interesting piece of data is that 95% of the successful breaches are a result of a known attack for which the organization already had the tool uh, uh, implemented but uh, simply they weren't utilizing that tool well enough. And so the conclusion is organizations are making the investment in cybersecurity, but in many cases they are not utilizing the tools that they've uh, acquired to the best extent. And so the main problem the breach and attack simulation solves is it helps organizations reach a better utilization of their security tools and basically uh, uh, take them to the max and make sure that they are configured well and optimized for their environment such that uh, um, they can control the controllables and they can be as protected as their investment uh, uh, entails, basically. Gotcha. And I, I read on your website that Safe Breach was an early contributor to the MITRE attack framework with initial contributions spanning methods for exfiltration, evasion, and command and control. And uh, since then, Safe Breach has continued to leverage the framework to allow organizations to quickly visualize their security posture and bring security and infrastructure teams together to update security controls and more effect hardened defenses, which is what you were saying in your last 10 seconds there. But can you explain to our audience how the safe breach leverages the MITRE attack framework? Yeah, so first of all, I think the MITRE attack framework is an amazing initiative and it created a few things for the industry, but first and foremost, a common language to describe generically uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures uh, of attackers. And what happened is that uh, a lot of organizations are basically building, referencing, and looking at their uh, security programs and security uh, uh, strategy through the lens of the MITRE attack framework. And so our platform allows them to uh, uh, simulate uh, or to uh, attack their organization safely with a, a, a very wide range of MITRE attack uh, techniques and then uh, basically look uh, from various uh, perspectives of the MITRE attack framework at their security posture and at the risk that it uh, entails. So it could be from a, a, a threat group perspective, or it could be from a technique and tactic perspective. It depends on the, on the use case that they are looking at, but we provide several tools to visualize things based on the MITRE attack framework, and then that helps organizations focus on where they want to uh, uh, put the resources in. And what was Safe Breach's role in creating the BAS cat category and how has the market evolved since you started walking us through the challenges you may have had in creating the category and where we are today with the BAS category? Yeah, so I think, you know, as any new category, which I think, by the way, which is uh, it's amazing that it didn't exist before. So if you think a few years back, no one had the ability to uh, really have a continuous view of their security posture. So there were only manual methods to challenge uh, the security uh, in, in, in security strategy, and they were a much less uh, a consistent in the way they are constructed. But in the early days uh, of the category, people simply didn't know what it is and how does it replace vulnerability management or uh, how does it complement vulnerability management or how does it uh, complement uh, penetration testing? Does it replace it or not? In 2017, uh, uh, Gartner defined the term breach and attack simulation, which was a great validation of what SafeBridge has been doing for years at the time. And, and since then, there has been a very a significant trend upwards in terms of how people are familiar with this technology and category and how people are utilizing it as well. So today, I'm happy to say that uh, there is, in most of the cases, in the vast majority of the cases, uh, projects and, and budgets, and people know what it is. And we are at the point where we need to explain why safe breach rather than 
why bridge and attack simulation. Yeah, and I wanted to unpack a few of the points that you made there. So before breach and attack simulation was a category, what was the positioning? How did you guys market this before it became breach and attack simulation? Yeah, so I think the problem remained the same, right? And the the, the early days of the company came from a, 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 our founder is actually a CISO. And the, the, the story of the company is that as a CISO of a technology company, he was looking for a way to understand where he is secure and where he is not. And he just couldn't find a, a, a good and scalable way to do that. And so decided to, uh, to start a company. So the story of the problem we solved has remained the same. We now have a nice market and category to work with, but this was the same the same story at the time. Um, I think there are, from a budget or a category perspective, uh, it, it was uh, less consistent. So in some cases, it was a part of a vulnerability management budget, some cases, security hygiene, security posture, in some cases, actual security control budget. Um, under under the fact that if you're investing X in a security control uh, strategy, you would invest a little bit more to make sure you're utilizing it well. So. And you touched on how does BAS complement or replace vulnerability testing and pen testing. So I'd love to dive into that a little bit. Yeah, so I think it doesn't replace any of them. On the vulnerability management side, there are two... Uh, aspects of your attack surface. So the first one focuses on your software infrastructure and its software vulnerabilities, the other on your security controls and your security strategy. Together, you get a full picture of your actual vulnerability. And so what we do today, we actually integrate with the top vulnerability management vendors, and we don't only help you understand where your security controls uh, are, are performing well and where uh, they should be updated or, or configured, but also we help prioritize the vulnerabilities based on how exploitable they are in your environment, given your compensating controls. In, on the pen testing side, so I think pen testing will be a manual operation that will be around a very specific goal defined for a pen test. This is something that you do maybe once or twice a year for a very specific uh, target, but you can't definitely do it on an organization-wide basis on all of your assets uh, in a way which is 24 by 7 and completely uh, scalable. And I think uh, this is how uh, uh, basically the things complement each other. When there is a specific project and you're looking for something really uh, specific, then pen testing uh, uh, is probably the, the direction. But if you are looking to validate your security program, your security operations uh, uh, continuously, and given the pace of change today, so basically what you tested a week ago is not even relevant a couple of weeks later, uh, then bridge and tax simulation would be the answer. And you mentioned budgets, like in the early days, there was not a checkbox or a category for this to get budget. So where would you bucket this category when trying to ask for budget? And where does this fall into the overall cybersecurity program and maturity model? Yeah, so in an early category, there is always a bit of a variance. So I mentioned the security operations would be the, the area and the category. And uh, from a budget, it's either a security operations budget or some of the security control programs budget or went, uh, a part of the vulnerability management budget. That was the early days. Uh, two days in most of the cases, there is a budget and a program for the opportunities we go to. And would you say that this category fits in both the blue team and red team activities? Yeah, so we see a variance there and we see more and more, uh, uh, you know, uh, a mix of those colors called purple team these days. Uh, so uh, uh, what happens is that there are several use cases uh, uh, for breach and attack simulation. The first uh, uh, the first one, which was became really big in the market, was security control validation, which is predominantly driven by the blue team and the security operations team. And they are interested in getting more from uh, the tools that they have. Um, but, but we do see a, a trend of red team and blue team sitting together in the same room and collaborating. 
uh, in what is called Purple Team exercises and definitely using uh, our platform to do that as well. And would you mind running through some of those top use cases? Yeah, so security control validation is one which I mentioned, and, and that could be anything either focusing on endpoint security, focusing on your security operations process, like your SIM platform and validating that you have the right detection there, uh, uh, focusing on your email security, on your uh, uh, perimeter security. Um, and then uh, the next one, which is also very common, would be the threat assessment use case. So think of a, a, an organization which is uh, getting the latest US CERT alert or getting a, a, a notification that there is an outbreak in the industry like a print nightmare or like a, 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 a dark side they run somewhere. And the, the executive level is asking, how are we doing with regards to that? Uh, in a previous life, uh, being a, a security vendor, I remember the calls from customers asking us, do we have protections? Are we protected? And so on. Uh, so our customers basically have a very quick answer to that. We have an SLA that uh, basically has the protections in the platform within hours of any outbreak or any US cert or something like that. And with the click of a button, they get an answer of where they are protected, how much they are protected, what they should do in order to uh, uh, remediate if, uh, if there are gaps. Um, and that helps uh, uh, the organization drive a program and basically cover things very quickly. Uh, so this is a threat assessment. Uh, another very common and very strategic use case that, uh, that we see is cloud security validation. We talked about in the beginning, the, uh, organizations are strategizing around their cloud uh, transition and actually accelerating that. The security team in many of the organizations is struggling to uh, uh, basically uh, let uh, uh, the organization move. And in many cases, it's even perceived as something which is holding the business from moving forward quickly with their cloud transition from certification, security reasons. Um, what uh, 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 we can do to help them is basically help them understand what matters. So when they have the visibility to understand where they are maybe a little bit more vulnerable or maybe where they are not vulnerable. And I think in one of the product management, there is a saying a good product manager needs to know what not to do. So also here in the cloud transition, I think uh, uh, security uh, uh, professionals in many cases are searching for areas where they can be confident in not doing something because they're so busy and because there are so many things to, uh, to look at. Uh, and I think that as they have this visibility and as they have a data-driven program to understand where they're going, they become an enabler rather than uh, a barrier to the business uh, uh, progress. Uh, and I think lastly is the one I mentioned before, what we call it risk-based vulnerability management, which is basically the notion of helping organizations prioritize vulnerabilities. As you probably know, there are tens of thousands of vulnerabilities uh, disclosed uh, per year. Organizations um, um, testify that they have the capacity to, on average, uh, uh, patch about 10% of the vulnerabilities that they find in the organization. And they are focusing these days on understanding which vulnerabilities to patch. And so a lot of organizations are, are using a threat intelligence to do that. We bring to the mix another aspect of this, and that's your compensating controls. In other words, if there is a vulnerability in a software, but there is an IPS system in front of it, and it's blocking its exploitation, then it's less important than another one which is actually exposed to attackers. So those are the, probably the top use cases. Cybersecurity Heroes is brought to you by Iron Scales an AI-powered, self-learning email security platform that helps security professionals proactively prevent, detect, and remediate phishing attacks in a matter of seconds, not hours or days. And we have an exclusive offer for our podcast listeners. Discover dormant phishing threats in your organization's mailboxes. Get a free 90-day scan back with a detailed report. Integrate in seconds with two clicks via API to Microsoft Office 365 and see what your current email security is missing. Go to ironscales.com slash free scan to learn more. Great. And what capabilities should such a platform? And I think it's important to probably clarify that breach and attack simulators are more of a platform than a tool, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think uh, first and foremost, 
security coverage. So if you are selecting a breach and attack simulation platform for control validation, for purple team, for cloud, you uh, need to make sure that you are uh, selecting a platform with the top uh, uh, security coverage and also the ability to update the coverage as the threat landscape evolves. We live in a very dynamic world and we need to make sure that uh, the platform is extensible, but also provides the service to extend the content. Uh, the other uh, area is on the platform itself. Look at things like, is the platform really safe? Does it uh, risk anything in production? This is something very big for organizations. How scalable it is. If I'm an enterprise, can I really scale this program in the enterprise? And can I really easily test everything or do a wide range of testing in the environment? And how easy it is to use. And I think lastly, this platform is a very tightly bound to the security ecosystem it is there to work with, right? And so the level of integration into that ecosystem makes a lot of difference into the level of visibility, into the level of remediation, into the level of uh, ease of implementation and also ease of uh, uh, getting value out of those results uh, from the platform. So look for integrations uh, into the ecosystem as well. And if we go into the POC stage, so you've already decided, okay, we want to try this out. We're looking at a few vendors and now we're going to do a POC. What advice would you give to companies during the POC and how would you define success? I, I know it depends, but perhaps you do have a success criteria that you, you, you could share. Well, we do, but they really, as you probably gathered by now, there are a lot of things you can do with such a capability. And I think one of the best advice I can uh, give organizations is to uh, understand what the focus is for the organization. Uh, um, uh, being impactful with such a platform is around uh, doing things which make a difference for the organization. So, for example, if cloud uh, strategy from an infrastructure perspective is uh, one of the top ID strategies for the organization, focus on that. If there is a, a big perimeter a, a, a protection project, a, a focus on that. So basically focus on the things which move the needle. And then, you know, how to demonstrate it in, in, in a proof of value or proof of concept is, is a secondary problem. But make sure that you are attaching your goals in terms of the project to what makes a difference for the organization. If you want to you know, make sure that your uh, security operations, uh, people, process, and technology are working together well, then focus on that. If there are many things that can be impactful in this platform capability, and I think defining the goals clearly early on uh, and then running them through the POC and then through the implementation as well and following through is a great tip. So if I understood correctly, because this platform is mapped to the MITRE attack framework, you really have longevity with the platform. The, the use out of it grows as your security program evolves. Yeah, I think that there are many reasons to do with uh, how things are moving fast these days, how the threat landscape is evolving, how organizations are moving fast, uh, how um, a talent shortage in security impacts teams uh, that brings people to understand that you can't be 100% protected. Now, the, such a platform will have thousands and thousands of techniques and attacks, a, a MITRE attack framework plus and various other areas, which you can test in your entire organization. The, the fact that you can do that doesn't mean that you can uh, uh, consume as a security team all of that information. And this is why we always come back to uh, the, the notion of focus. So, um, of course, there is there are so many things that, uh, uh, that you can do. Start somewhere which moves the needle for the organization and then build and add and expand. And this is what happens with uh, uh, most of our customers. And uh, they will start somewhere and then expand the program. And as it expands, it becomes more and more strategic for the organization. Got you. And in terms of like misconceptions around the technology and the platform, what would you say are some of those? 
Yeah, so I think it's exactly that. I, I think that the the um, the biggest misconception is that the people have um, have uh, um, already come to the realization, for example, that layered security is a good strategy because no tool will protect you one hundred percent, right? And so, I think there is sometimes a, a, a misconception in two directions. So one misconception could be. I want to test all of the attacks in the world because the more I know, the better I am. And that's one misconception. In most of the cases, there is already an, an, an information fatigue on the security team. So our recommendation would be always to, you know, to, to focus on mo- what moves the needed for the business. The other would be to be very tactical. I only want to test that specific technique uh, because this is what I'm focused on as a person this moment. But does it necessarily mean something for my organization? Does it necessarily impact what the, the, the cybersecurity risk for my organization? And I think this is a question we should all ask ourselves. And I think security teams and, and, and CISOs are starting to come to the realization and to be evaluated on how effective they are with regards to their ability to create value for the business. And you talked about attack scenarios. What are the most popular attack scenarios organizations are running today by using your platform? So this is an easy answer because our industry is very driven by uh, things which are very recent and happening right now. So Print Nightmare is very big at the moment and the capability is there. And then another uh, ransomware. Everybody is it's all about ransomware these days and so many variants and so many capabilities uh, uh, on ransomware everywhere from the, from the infiltration through to the propagation, through to the infection and the actual behavior and the encryption capabilities. There's so much you can do around ransomware and so many security controls can be involved that ransomware becomes a program for organizations. And then email security is also really popular, being one of the top and penetration or infiltration methods is something which is very big as well. You mentioned like ransomware being obviously one of the top priorities and challenges. So what are some of the other most challenging areas for organizations based on your customer facing experience? Yeah, so I think there are a, a, I think there are a couple. So the first one is uh, something I mentioned uh, uh, before is the threat assessment uh, uh, area. So um, uh, basically uh, uh, um, mature teams are uh, looking at their capabilities to uh, detect um, uh, behaviors and patterns which have been uh, demonstrated by uh, threats that the organization should worry about. So they utilize threat intelligence. For example, you know, let's take an example. It's easy to explain. I'm a financial organization. I'm looking at the FIN7 or FIN6 uh, uh, attack scenarios. And I want to understand whether my organization has the generic capabilities to protect from those behaviors. And I want to understand whether I'm detecting the various stages of the threat and uh, basically assemble that as a threat in my organization. So this is uh, uh, um, uh, something which involves a lot of the security program and goes all the way from the visibility, the data collection through to the security controls and then to the uh, security operations, uh, uh, event management, uh, stock detection, incident response capabilities. Uh, So this is one. Um, I, I think the other one which organizations are still struggling with is uh, a lot of the post, uh, uh, post-exploitation, post-attack uh, uh, areas, which is uh, sensitive data exfiltration. So each organization will have their crown jewels from a data perspective, like credit cards, like social security numbers, PII, and so on, with uh, uh, all the regulation around the handling of data. Uh, um, uh, the ability to have the controls in place uh, uh, such that even if uh, uh, something happens, it will be harder to actually take the data out of the organization is something which is, is still interesting. Awesome. And then in, in terms of the impact of such a program on the business and the security program, can you summarize how leveraging a platform like yours can impact a company's program? Yeah, so I, I think there is a huge impact potential here. And, and we are seeing that in the organizations we work with. First of all, I mentioned that helping the security team become an enabler, helping the security team say something like, okay, 
we can worry less about that area. Let's worry about this area. It's something very big uh, and, and, and was very hard to do uh, uh, before that. But if you ran the attack and we were protected at some area, even if something is less uh, regulated or less compliant behind it, you can still say that. Um, and if you're worried about effective security, this is a very big impact. Then um, uh, communicating the right uh, uh, spend strategy as a result of that. So how do we know that we are spending our security budget uh, and getting the ROI from our security tools as we expect? And how do we know what's the next area we need to spend is something which is very big for organizations. And so, so the program starts with utilizing your tools better, but then what comes next and where are my risks and wh where do I invest? is something uh, um, extremely uh, uh, important. And then we also help uh, security teams uh, basically communicate what they do. So uh, showing that uh, over time, the security programs are going in the right direction and showing that based on data uh, across the entire organization, which is consistent and which is uh, talking in the same language from a data uh, perspective, is something which is um, extremely impactful as well. And can you give like some examples of the metrics or the reports that CISOs or the directors or the managers are using the product? What impresses them the most? Yeah, so I think for every piece of, of data that we bring to the table, we are very flexible in how you can visualize it. And this receives really well from my organization. So let's say I'm a CISO. I have an enterprise environment. Some of it is my original corporate. Some of it is the source of 20 acquisitions that I've done in the past couple of years. And now I want to have a single consistent baseline of security posture and evaluate that across those business units and then look at my attack surface across each of those business units and see how it develops over time and see uh, uh, that uh, basically things are moving in the right direction over time. Uh, so I can look at the dashboard, uh, which tells me how uh, each security unit is advancing. I can start with the overall security posture and then I can start breaking it down, whether it is by uh, the different security control categories, like how they're doing on endpoint versus how they're doing on a network perimeter segmentation and all of those or it could be based on the miter attack framework so how are they doing by each tactic or by each technique uh, depending on how i've decided to build my security program so that all can be visualized and basically be consumed on a regular basis based on continuous testing of, of on, on the threat side there is another interesting example is on the threat side so we talked about evaluating how the entire organization is positioned against a dark side uh, ransomware so once that tested across the organization i can uh, uh, have a dashboard which shows me how the threat develops in the organization, where am I better at stopping it, and where am I less better based on the different MITRE tactics. And then I can drill down and start doing a top-down analysis to the details of where I failed and export that information to operational teams for, for creating an operational program. Yeah, it's a fascinating area to discuss because I think the biggest challenges security teams and security leaders have is translating the business risk to the C-suite and making it simple and easy to understand and digest for a plethora of reasons. But for sure, trying to get budget, you, you have to demonstrate in simple terms why you need that budget. So I'm just curious, do you have any insights or advice from the reports and metrics that your platform provides? What works best when trying to deliver this message to the C-suite? Yeah, I, I think this is where we see the category going, is the ability to help organizations drive their security strategy and communicate that to the rest of the organization. That, that is, I think, uh, the, the, the notion of understanding your cybersecurity risk and understanding your ROI is definitely something which we work with, uh, which we work to do with our customers. Uh, I think it's a topic for another full podcast because it's a big one. Uh, but, but yeah, it's around basically understanding your uh, loss scenarios 
uh, uh, defining the uh, capability to simulate them and then understanding what's the probability of them happening and what is going to be the impact on the organization if they really happen. Um, and and th there are various models to uh, assess that. Um, there is a lot, a lot of names out there, so from risk matrices to FAIR model to others, but um, th they all come down to understanding likelihood on one end and a, a potential impact on the other to derive a, a, some sort of a risk matrix uh, which the organization can align around. So uh, this is definitely something which we are uh, engaged in, and I think that uh, this is uh, also a great way to help organizations drive their security strategy across the board, from technology, through security controls, through vulnerabilities, through security operations, various areas in the security program. Where else do you see the BAS category going in the next couple of years? So I think around that, um, uh, there is a, a lot more that, uh, uh, that we can expand to and a lot more types of information that we can gather in order to improve the understanding and the visibility and the ability to, to essentially drive that strategy and value and communication layer. The other direction, which is definitely in, in that same sort of height, is, is around automation. So uh, we are starting to understand the amount and the pace and the things that we need to manage as a security organization are uh, going to entail automation and people are going to have to automate uh, uh, their uh, at least most of their operations and uh, i think that the uh, breach and attack simulation has a great role to play there and as part if you think about uh, how a ci cd pipeline in development is working as part of that uh, security validation has a great role to play in a network which continually continuously optimizes itself uh, for security as well. And as we wrap up here today, is there anything else you would like to add? Um, yeah, I think I, I invite people to explore more about about the space and about what uh, uh, what we do, and hopefully we can all make the world a more secure and better place. Well, that's the dream. Um, <laughs> And before we close out, would you give us a you know thirty second pitch on the safe breach because there are quite a few bass vendors out there today. So how are you guys different? Yeah, the safe breach is a, a platform, a, the breach and attack simulation platform, which is one of the pioneers of the industry. You will find us in uh, the top organizations in the world, and and the reasons for that is that we have the best uh, security coverage and the best platform to support that. So the ability to update coverage is the patented capability of safe breach and definitely a platform which is easy to use and also has the most flexible and the most comprehensive ways to visualize and report on uh, the security uh, posture and so i invite you to explore more thank you so much before we close out here if anybody would like to get in touch with you ask more questions on this subject how can they get in touch yeah, so they can definitely get in touch with us through our website and uh, we will uh, definitely help with any questions there uh, there are. And are you open to DMs on LinkedIn if people want to reach out to you? Sure. Always open to uh, talk to uh, interesting people. Great. So we'll definitely add that to the show notes. So thank you so much again for taking the time to join us today on Cybersecurity Heroes. And to the rest of you, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Great to be here. That's a wrap for this episode of Cybersecurity Heroes. Practical and experiential knowledge on a day in the life of security heroes. Catch our next episode by subscribing through your favorite podcast platform. If you're listening in Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating for the show. They really help a lot. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.